Big a bigot, big correct. Mm -hmm. So, it, which, he who frames the argument usually wins the debate. So if you frame, frame the argument by saying you're pro-rights, and the other person by definition must therefore be anti-rights, and therefore because they're bigoted against your, your declared rights, that they are an anti-rights bigot, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, so this is how we would begin to win the debate, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when, uh, when Chuck is done, because I want to defer to, to, to you and I'm taking your time. Charles and I had this conversation earlier, because I'm a Charles, he's a Charles, and I always ask all the Charles, when you grew up, were you a Chuck, a Charlie, a Chucky, or a Charles? <coughs> and uh, I always tell if anybody calls me Charles, I know they don't know me because I'm Chuck. Uh, I'm the executive director of Capro, uh, but I'm here also representing today uh, Oath Keepers. Uh, the Oath Keeper guy in Northern California, Rocky Twitchell, is a fireman over at Davis. And he goes, Chuck, can you do it for me? I can't make it. So I said, yeah, be glad to. I am an Oath Keeper. Uh, how many former military do we have here? Couple. How many people have held elected office? Couple. So when you took that oath of office and said you swore to protect and defend the Constitution of the, United, of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, which is what the basis of Oath Keeper is about. Stuart Rhodes, the founder of Oath Keepers, lives out in Montana. He was a former uh, paratrooper U.S. Army, one of those weird army outfits. They got so many weird. I, mean, I was a Navy. I don't know what those guys do. Uh, and uh, he also went to Yale Law School. And as he graduated, he wrote a lot of the doctrine and law on enemy combatants. So he knew what he was talking about. Well, you all remember what happened in Katrina. And Stuart was watching that. And the rest of us were watching. Everybody watched what was going on in Katrina. And there was one thing that disturbed him tremendously. Because basically, the New Orleans Police Department was out of order. There was rioting in the streets. Everything was out of control. But there were parts of New Orleans that were high and dry. And there were people sitting there. They're safe, there's no police, they're protected. It says, got a pit bull, got a 45, leave me alone. You know, And that's where they, they, they were, were in the high and dry areas. Well, that wasn't good enough for the people in charge. They said, look, we need to go check on all these people, but we need to see if anybody has any guns or weapons, and we need to confiscate them. So that order went, out, order went out to all sheriffs, all National Guard units, and sheriff's departments. And most of them complied but not all of them. There was one National Guard unit out of Utah, and these guys in their real life are cops. Regular cops, they knew the law. And they got the order, and from their commanding officer coming on down said, we will not confiscate guns from citizens of these United States. There was one sheriff's department, one sheriff's department was going around confiscating guns, pulling up on guys that were in boats trying to get the hell out of there, yeah, I was going, you guys say, create a hand weapons, yeah. Guns are drawn, pull them up, drop them, and they take the guns and disappear. No receipts, no nothing. Well, the one that disturbed Stewart the most was the cops were going around, hi, how are you? You safe? We're just checking on you. You got food, you got water. Well, there was this little old lady. And, you know, she's the kind of the smoker with the cough, you know, she must weigh about 90 pounds. She's sitting there, they go, how you doing, man? Well, I'm fine. It's just, Got everything, got me and my little dog, I got plenty of food and smoke, so I'm, I'm set. Do you have any weapons? Well, yeah, yeah, I do. I got this little gun. She's got a little 25 caliber. Doesn't work, but she's got a little 25 caliber. She goes, yeah, I got this, but we haven't had any problems. Next thing you know, these two burly guys jump this little old lady. And this is on video, it was on national TV. And they jumped her, pushed her against the wall, and started pummeling her. Hit her in the face numerous times put her in the plastic cuffs, took her out, took the gun away. What did she do wrong? Nothing. She was home, she was by herself, she had food, she was trying to be left alone, and she felt she could protect herself. Was that her right as a citizen? Well, Stewart saw that, and he says, when I saw that, I started choking in my beer. I couldn't believe what they were doing. Now, this comes home to us here in California, because you know who those two cops were that did that? California Highway Patrol. There were Highway Patrol senior command officers from Sacramento that went down and said, oh wow, government federalization, extra money, let's go down. Well, most of the rank and file CHP that I know said, those guys are a bunch of yahoos. Those are the last guys we should have sent. 
But they were the ones, and they were the ones that beat up the old lady. Now, did she make money from the state of California? Yes, she did. But what was wrong with that? Well, that, that triggered Stewart, and he goes, something's wrong with that. Because then he found out there were two other sheriff's department that would come up and say, excuse me, sir, do you have weapons? He goes, yes, sir, I do. You got ammo for it? Yes, sir, I do. Good. <laughs> Go on to the next guy. You, you got, you're covered. You guys are fine. We know who you are. If we need you, we'll call you. Not give us your guns. Could you help us? So two sheriff's departments said, we support the rights of people to protect themselves. One sheriff's department in the city of New Orleans and a couple of National Guard units were seizing weapons through force from private citizens. So that was the triggering to start something to protect the rights and let the service people and the people that are Oath Keepers know about it. Now a study was made, uh, this is going back to 2008, no, 2010, at 29 Palms Marine Base, if you know where that was. And they went and asked a bunch of young Marines, just coming off, said, would you fire on Americans? I don't know. I guess if they ordered me, I would. And they go, do you know about your oath office? My oath of what? <laughs> and they found out as they go around, they, the people that take the oath don't understand it. Now, I have a personal one on that. For some reason, my daughter's old boyfriend still like me, even though she's married and gone. One of them was a sergeant in the higher patrol in San Clemente. And Tom, I called him up. Now he was Navy and higher patrol and a sergeant. I said, Tom, that's your oath of office. He goes, what? I go, did you take it? He goes, yeah, I think so. So if it came to pass and you got to disarm Americans, would you do it? He goes, yeah, if they told me to. Why? Your oath of office is contrary to it. But what does that mean? Now he's not a dumb kid. He's smart. But he just goes through the road. So Oath Keepers was, is basically founded to educate our law enforcement people and our military people, both active and reserves and retired, that you have to honor your oath of office. Now, we passed around some flyers about what Oath Keepers is about, OK? And that is what Oath Keepers is about. Do you have the right to protect yourself? And it's getting into the right of the Second Amendment, which we can talk some more specific about that. But it has to do with the Second Amendment, the rights to protect a free state. That's what the guns are for. The oath of office is part of that, to help that out. So we have a problem out there in the world about how many people that take the oath even know what it's about. And anybody you meet that's in the military, law enforcement, ask them about it. I mean, I swear to God, if I get stopped, and I've been stopped a couple of times since then, I have, oh, are you an oath keeper? <laughs> What's that mean, sir? <laughs> and I kind of educate, and they go, yeah, I guess I am. So once they hear about it, they're pretty much there. So our goal, education, tell everybody what's going on, and see what's happening. What is interesting, Stewart did a rally in New York, which you know New York is pushing through the registration, and they've been confiscating weapons through stings. And in Albany, New York, when he did this, this is last month now, two months ago, 16 of the Oath Keepers that showed up were NYPD officers. And I go, so Stuart, what did the cops from New York say? And they go, they're not taking our guns. Not only are we, the police officers of New York, arming up, the citizens of New York are arming up because they know the government is coming. So I'll stop there and then we can go with our 20 questions. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sure that some of you are probably wondering what it is that I'm doing up here on this panel, and it's not because I'm a delegate here in California. Uh, I am a graduate of the Appleseed classes. Have any of you ever heard of Appleseed? Anybody? I got one class up there. That's about it. Oh, two. Excellent. And from a woman. That's beautiful. There's a website called appleseedinfo.org, and they are a member or an offshoot of the Revolutionary War Veterans Association. They are a nonpartisan group that teaches shooting, accuracy, adjustment, safety, training regarding all forms of firearms. Their classes are free. All you are required to pay is the range fees. So I have attended two of these classes. I have graduated from both. I am currently qualified to be a shoot instructor, and I am also qualified for the civilian marksmanship program, which entitles me to buy military surplus arms and ammunition. These classes are available to each and every person. They offer them in rifles, they offer them handguns, they also offer center fire and rim fire. And for those of you who don't know, those two classes are dependent upon the caliber 
of the firearm and the ammunition that you are shooting. So this subject is very near and dear to me as well. I enjoyed my classes, I met a great many people, and I, met a I learned a great many things. Um, one of the things that you hear most in the media these days is that there's crazy people running around with firearms that they don't know what they're doing. They don't have training. Nobody knows how to do it. Nobody knows what it's about. That's an absolute lie. The resources are there. We just need to be able to share with people where and how you can find them. And I will reiterate the website again, appleseedinfo.org. And the classes are free. Appleseed? Appleseed. Apple Yes, sir. Just like the fruit, appleseedinfo.org. Thank you, So I've enjoyed these classes. I've enjoyed the opportunities. I've made friends with other Appleseed instructors and students and participants across the country. Um, one of the things that I enjoy most discussing with them is, of course, the big issues that we are all talking about from the mainstream media today. And for you gentlemen, I would like to hear your thoughts. Um, one of them is the mental health issue. We talk a lot about how crazy people have access to guns. Well, mental health is not an issue that is greatly addressed, and I believe that it needs to be. I also work for a health insurance company. So these two things are, are things that I deal with on a regular basis, and I would like to hear how you two gentlemen would respond to those who question you know, the ability of folks who are unstable to be able to buy and own firearms. Mr. Health. Well, the first thing I'll say is that they say that one in three people in the United States have a mental health issues. So if you look to your left and your right and those folks look normal, <laughs> it's you. Uh, I'm not making light of the question, but I am making another point, and that's that you should never let the issue wear you down to the point of where you don't have a sense of humor left. Because if you don't, because if you do, the other side has won. The only time that you are defeated is when you declare your own defeat. It's a very, it's a very important point. You keep fighting no matter what. No matter how many things one side tries to take away, we have other things. You know, eventually, we're going to have particle beam weapons and the firearm issue will become moot. So, and those aren't firearms, you know. They're just weapons. Anyway, um, to answer your question about mental health, to, to come to the point, sorry to belabor it, but, First of all, it is the notion that you are ever going to keep insane people from getting a hold of dangerous things is in and of itself insane. You can never stop people who are have no sense of, it's called them in law, it's called the McNaught rule. The person has to know the quality and character of their acts. And if a person doesn't know the quality and character of their own acts, expecting them to delineate right from wrong is by definition insane. So you are not ever going to stop crazy people from getting a hold of things to do damage, harm, and, and mayhem to their fellow man and to society at large. What you can do is a couple of things. Number one, we can go back and revisit the doctrine of incarceration of people against their will that we changed in the, in the mid to late 70s. It, you, it was considered in the late 70s, there were some, a couple of court decisions that said that it was inhumane to incarcerate people against their will who were in danger to themselves and society. We need to look at that again. And we need to deliberate, deliberatively and in a lawful and constitutional manner revisit the laws about when you can incarcerate someone who's a danger against themselves. We need to look at that. And number one. Number two is that we could take some of the regulatory apparatus that is currently in place, especially in places like the People's Republic of New York and here in the PRC, and you could and you could take some of those assets and you could devote them to going after people. California has a Department of Justice squad that does this, and it's not evil, right? You could go after the people who are convicted, violent convicted felons, not nonviolent ones, but violent convicted felons and people with a known history of mental health. And with a warrant, you could look and see if they have weapons. I see no problem with doing that. Libertarians may disagree with me on that, and that is certainly a principal place to stand. But I don't see if you constitutionally look to try and keep people who are who may very, very well documentably and lawfully be a harm to themselves and others from having weapons. That said, 
The only way you are ever going to stop someone once they're in the process of committing an atrocity is with dead, lawful, deadly force. And you're seeing this throughout the states. More and more states, with the exception of Connecticut and, 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 and here, are going shall issue. Even this county now is shall issue, I'm, I'm told. I was told very recently, is shall issue on CCW permits. Anybody doesn't know what shall issue is? Anybody doesn't know? Shall issue means if you apply, they shall issue it to you unless you have a disability, such as your prohibited possessor. You have, uh, what would stop you from legally owning a gun in the United States would stop you from getting a concealed carry permit. A, that you're a convicted felon. B, that you're a domestic violence abu abuser uh, with possibly misdemeanor domestic violence, which I disagree with, but it's the law right now, federal law, since 1996. Um, if you've been uh, adjudicated mentally incompetent by a court, if you are uh, have a restraining order against you, or if you've been dishonorably discharged from the military, or if you're here in the United States illegally, those are the disabling conditions that uh, prohibit you legally from having a firearm in the United States. Other than that, they have to give you the permit if you apply for it. Um, frankly, I'm against the idea, I'm a concealed weapons permit instructor in Arizona, and I'm against the idea of the, the necessity of concealed weapons permits. That might seem at odds, that might seem to be an economy between those two, but there's not. Because in Arizona, we made the concealed weapons permit optional. You want to get one? Fine. It's recognized by 31 other states. You, you are purchasing a benefit from the government voluntarily, not at the fear of coercion for being arrested for carrying concealed without a permit. Perfectly fine by me. So, uh, does that does that answer the question? Does that engender any other questions? Yeah, could you come to the microphone, please, so we can all hear your question? I'm sorry, right into the microphone. I can't hear what you're saying. Yeah, I hear you. Wow. Like the time of volume. Okay, I have that. Uh, the person, I know this is slightly off the issue of the but the person, Lanza, I his name is, uh, what, uh, what was his first name? Uh, Adam Lanza? Adam Lanza, there you go. Yeah. Adam Lanza, you know, certainly had, or, had Asperger's syndrome. Right. And a lot of people have Asperger's syndrome, and you, uh, I just want to have you know that, uh, and people that have Asperger's syndrome get bullied a lot. Okay. So there's a lot of people, particularly in Sacramento, including myself, I have Asperger's syndrome also. So, you know, you have to be a little bit careful about, uh, they almost say he has Asperger's syndrome, but they refuse, I don't know why they don't put this in media. Well, I don't know that anybody's focusing on it, but the point of the matter is a person's either a danger to himself and others or they're not. And if that decision has been made and adjudicated by a court, that makes you a prohibited possessor in the United States according to 18 U.S. Code 922. So it's, it's, excuse me, yeah, I think it's 922. I can't remember which part of the statute, but that's where it's located. If a person is declared to be incompetent by a court, their rights can be severed. I believe that is lawful, and I don't think that's a trespass against your right to keep and bear arms. You're, if you can't legitimately discharge the right without being a danger to yourself, then the court has the authority to declare that you're incompetent to do so. And I don't see that as being an infringement against yours and my rights. Okay, but then that wouldn't apply to Adam Lanza because Adam Lanza had Asperger's. Well, but the question was whether or not the court had decided through a lawful, through due process, that he was a danger to himself. And I believe that had he been investigated thoroughly, that he would have been declared a danger to himself. And I believe the process could have been allowed to work. <coughs> the other thing is, is, part of what people don't know is Lanza tried to buy a rifle. But he was only 20 years old, and he was turned down because of his age, because Connecticut has a 21-year-old cutoff as opposed to an 18-year-old cutoff. So the law did work. It just didn't stop him because he was crazy it didn't, and, and a danger. It didn't stop him from committing murder, which I think is already illegal. It didn't stop him from committing murder in order to get the weapons that he got. Do you stop more people from having Asperger's syndrome? Get uh, weapons, or that, that would kill a lot of people, including uh, possibly Bill Gates, with Asperger's syndrome. Well, I'm not sure that disarming Bill Gates is a horrible idea. <laughs> 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 That's not a bad idea. I'm being facetious. I, I, first of all, no. It, it, I, a person would have to be declared by the court to be either a danger to himself or to others. Okay. And assuming through due process of law that that happens, the person's rights can be severed. We have, you know, if I may take this opportunity, 
we have the thing at JPFO, uh, we call it the five kosher gun laws. Have you ever had anyone ask you in a debate, well, don't you believe in reasonable gun control? Has anyone ever had that, that, that question? My response is yes. I do believe in reasonable gun control. There's five reasonable gun control, control laws. Can you name them? And you always get sort of a gagging noise on the other, other end of the conversation. One, if you misbehave criminally with a firearm, the court can sever your rights. Two, if you're adjudicated mentally incompetent, that same court can sever your rights. Three, if you're less than 18, your rights to keep and bear arms come through your parents. Four, you, you are responsible for, every, for the result of every single shot you fire. And five, anyone, for any reason, in elective or appointive office or bureaucratic office, who attempts to take a firearm from you from any but the first four reasons is immediately arrested, imprisoned, and severely fined. Those are the five more gun control. The problem with our gun control, gun control with control in quotes, the problem with our gun control laws today is that they have a negative consequence for you and I, the person who has not misbehaved, and yet there is no negative consequence for the for, for the trooper that uh, that Chuck talked about a little while ago. He's not been prosecuted. He should be he should be prosecuted for us uh, for aggravated assault and for theft, and also for burglary for entering the house with the intent to commit the theft. Did that answer your question? Yeah, but to answer my question, you have to, uh, again, I wouldn't cover, I might, might not cover uh, Adam Ronson because, again, he had, had a big problem with what she had asked for. He said, I mean, people bullied him in school. Right, but uh, it did answer the question in terms of it, whether or not he was violent, and that's what it did. Thank you for your question. Right. Matt, anyone else? Um, Chuck, did you want to address it too? Go ahead. Oh, I, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about um, the effects of gun control on lawful citizens. Um, mm -hmm given that the government is sort of trying to label libertarians as quote-unquote domestic terrorists, do you think they can pull into question our political beliefs and then question our mental health um, to, to try to you know, stop people that are political dissenters from protecting themselves? Government can and will do anything it can get, it can get away with. And to the extent that you allow it, frankly, I'm appalled at some of the reaction I got in the hallway of people being a member of, of JPFO. There's a certain level of apathy that as humans we all have, and obviously if you look at my waistline, I must have some of it too. But we need to be participants in our government. One of the things that I tell people that you need to learn how to do if you want to be effective, and if you want to be an effective libertarian too, and, uh, truth in advertising, I'm not a libertarian. I, I have a lot of libertarian leanings, but the point of the matter is, is if you want to be effective as an activist, you have got to learn lawfully and peaceably how to take the tailpipe of government and bend it around using lawful means and insert it so far down its own intake, I used to say carburetor, but that dates me, but down its own intake so that whatever entity it is that's abusing your freedom chokes on its own exhaust. And if you don't know how to do that, you're not an effective activist. Now, it may take individual action. It probably will not. It may take forming an association of like-minded individuals who use those same principles of liberty and of, 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 of law and apply them with very directed pressure to the weakest point in government so that you break the link of tyranny. Thank you. I have a question for you. Please. Um, Please into the microphone. What is the JPFO's um, stance on disarmament of the Palestinian people? We have none. Okay. We have none. We have no. We have no opinion whatsoever on anything outside of the United States. Okay. It's not our issue. Thanks for asking. Our questions to the whole family. Yeah, questions to both of us, but I guess. Okay. Yeah. So, um, if one of the purposes of the Second Amendment is so that citizens can protect themselves from the government. Um, mm -hmm. uh, if, if the government is severely more armed, you know, like, so for example, if you own weapons, uh, you know, like the rifle or something, but they have SWAT teams with all kinds of, you know, gear, then there's, 
there's a, there's like kind of a difference in in, uh, in disparity of force. Yeah, yeah. Head, head, you lose. Yeah, which back say when the Second Amendment was written, uh, you know, it was musket against musket. Yeah. Now they may have had more muskets, but it was still musket against musket. So. You know, could you kind of address that issue? I, I agree. That's not an argument in favor of yeah. gun control, but just well, uh, the the issue is not about guns. I want to go back to the mental health real quick. I'll jump on this. Met, this mental health thing. I mean, we, we as he said, it's obviously not me. It must be one of those two. Okay, <laughs> but it we've got them out there, and what they're trying to do is to make it a people control issue. This is about people control. We have mental health issues. We've always had that. With the cops, when you talk to them, they do everything they can to get the guns out of the bad guy's hands. The enemy right now is the government towards us, we the people. It's got to be we the people. Now, we get focused on you know muskets versus AR-15s, AR-15s versus this. That's really not the issue. This is the actual issue that we miss. The Second Amendment says a well-regulated militia, and we'll define that in a minute, being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So, a re regulated militia, what's that? Well, you're getting back to the Revolutionary War. The, re the, re the militia of the several states, you guys remember that from civics and history? Each state had its own army, the militia. It's us, the people, we're the militia, okay? We had that up until the 1900s, and it all kind of got into issues. California has a statute today called the Unorganized Militia. Well, that's BS, because they don't have the right to do that, okay? So, the regulated militia necessary to the security of a free state. What keeps a state free? Is it our government? Well, we've seen what they've done over the years. More control, more control, more control. But it's the right of the people to keep and bear arms to protect us to keep a free state. So what are those arms? They're whatever necessary to protect the free state. Now, if you go back to Revolutionary War times, the standard at the time was the musket. But guess what? The, US, the, the colonists had better muskets because ours were rifled, theirs weren't. We could go 300 yards, they could go about 50 and be effective. So we actually had an advantage. Everybody in the U.S. had the same kind of weapon. In the Civil War, both sides had roughly the same firepower. If you, how many people are, I'm going to say, 50 years and over? Do you guys remember the armories that we used to have? Yeah. What were those armories for? They weren't there just for the dances and meet the prom queen. They had vehicles in them. They had weapons in them. They had armor in them. And they were for us. They were for us, the citizens, because we were the militia. But over the years, because of the little incident that happened in 1946 called the Battle of Athens, they slowly took away the armories. They took away our ability to fight against the federal government, or the state government for that matter. The militia was formed to stop insurrection, to stop an overbearing government, and foreign invasion. Homeland security is us. And we should be having similar, same kind of weapons that our military or potential military should have. So when you get it down to, is it a personal right, self-defense? Yeah, we have that. To have a gun in your house? Yeah, we should have that. But the primary call is to defend the free state, and that's what gets lost along the way here. And that's why it's so important. So if, whatever the guns are, whatever the weapons are, if they were using slingshots, we need slingshots. If they got tanks, I don't know how we're going to get tanks. But in the old days, when you had the armies, you'd see jeeps and stuff in there. You'd see APCs and have stuff that we could use. We'd have a local militia National Guard unit. National Guard, by the way, is not the militia. The National Guard is federal. It is the U.S. Army being assigned to the state. But the militia is everybody here. Yes, sir. Oh, I appreciate you explaining that a little more. I have a friend in Florida. I'm, I'm going to get to a question. Um, he's into this well-regulated militia. My mental momentum from the media influence was... Oh, bad. Sure to hear that. <laughs> I know, I know. But that, in the younger days. Anyway, so there was some mental momentum. He kept repeating to me, well... Regulated. Then he got me to the point where, oh, this is a really good idea. He went to his state legislator. What are you going to do to protect the people of Florida? You know, how about the well-regulated militia? I told him, you know what? 
uh, you might want to tell him this. There are about 400 militia groups forming from uh, in the southern states, from Arizona up to North Carolina, some in Michigan, some in Wisconsin. You might want to tell him, you might want to have a well-regulated militia, or you will have a militia. My question is, all right, with this position of a well-regulated, are you approaching state legislatures to try and get this revived? It's not my job, it's your job. Yeah, that's your job. Also, guys, we can't make statements. We've got to come right to a question. We only have 10 minutes left. So um, I just I, I, I wanted to address something about the, the type of weaponry. I want you to imagine, I'm going to do this as fast as I can. Imagine that you're standing in a field, and folks, if you're having a conversation going, and it's not here, take it outside if you would, please. <whistles> guys, if you've got a conversation going, outside. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> He who frames the debate usually wins the argument. So let's imagine for a moment that you're standing, it's 1776, and you're standing not far from Trenton, New Jersey, and the soldiers with rags on their feet are marching towards Trenton, okay? And the uh, and, and some, a horseman rides up and says, I have a message, I'm a messenger, I must speak with General Washington. And they usher him to General Washington. He says, General, there's been a new development in the field of battle. I've been instructed to demonstrate this for you. And he says, go ahead, hurry up, we don't have time. And he pulls out this leather case and he opens it up and there's a rag. And there's this funny looking long black thing. And he pulls it out. And Washington looks at it and he says, it looks like some kind of flintlock, but where's the, where's the lock work? He says, General, I'll demonstrate, but it's inside. And he pulls it out, he reaches into his messenger bag, and he takes out a long stick-like thing, and he puts it into the bottom of the rifle, pulls back the charging handle, and he says, clear out away. And there's a sapling about 20 yards down. And he picks this thing up, it's an M16, he picks it up and four four bursts, and the sapling falls over. And he pulls out the mag, and he pulls